Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to discuss early stage startups and venture capital's responsibilities in anticipating and mitigating business and public risks related to the environment, economic inequality, labor, privacy, and beyond. We'll talk about ESG and impact investing, and we'll demo our two alternative solutions that can be used for startups and investors. Feel free to drop in questions throughout the presentation using the Zoom Q&A feature. We'll save time at the end to address a couple of those. Before we begin, I wanna introduce myself. I'm Liz, a technology and public purpose fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. For the last few years, I've been working with the fund Urban Us, an early stage venture group that invests in climate tech and the future of cities. With me today are Natalie and Campbell, both master's students at the Harvard Kennedy School who have been working closely with me on this VC and public purpose research. Natalie and Campbell, over to you. Great, thanks Liz. So before we get started, we wanted to kick off with some trivia. So please use the Zoom function below to answer the following questions. Yes, the trivia questions that we will span, that we will span across the six dimensions that we covered in our research, uh, including environment, labor, labor and inclusion, privacy and security, diversity, um, government governance and anti-corruption, and long-term value, cre long value creation. So this is hopefully a nice warm up for Lee's presentation that will follow. All right, so for question one, I see we're already getting some uh, answers in there, but it's what percent of greenhouse gas emissions for most consumer goods companies comes from their supply chain versus their own owned and operated facilities? Give you a minute to respond. All right, looking good, everyone. It looks like we have a majority of folks saying that the number is 80% and you all are correct. Uh, according to McKinsey, the typical consumer company supply chain does create the vast proportion um, of greenhouse gas emissions. It's over 80% and does account for over 90% uh, of the impact on land, on air, um, and other geological resources. Right. Our second question is around how many jobs were created in the U.S. by startups uh, that were less than one year old last year alone. You're getting some response. Things are still changing. We'll give you guys more 20 seconds. I think, I think, yeah, right. Um, can you all see the results? I think, again, like you got that correctly, according to Statista in 2020, there were precisely 3,114,111 new jobs created through startups business in the US. All right, moving on to question three, we'll see if we can stump you. Uh, so for, in terms of privacy and security, uh, Ricotta is a cloud-based security camera stop, uh, startup. Uh, they recently suffered a data breach that exposed how many computers? All right, guys, got it again. Um, maybe we made these too easy. Um, so the, the correct answer is 150,000 and Mercado customers like Tesla, Equinox, hospitals, and even jails were compromised. Okay, on to our fourth question around diversity and inclusion. Um, our question is company C A X percent decrease in employee turnover when they offer disability community outreach programs. I think we have all the answers. Um, and right, so uh, yeah, you all got it right again, most of you at least. Um, let me get you like to the Accenture report on that. According to an Accenture report, the study showed that working alongside employees with disabilities um, makes non-disabled individuals workers 
more aware of how to make the workplace more inclusive and they also uh, stay more engaged and productive in productive and hiring uh, even one percent of more disabled persons in the u.s would lead to a 25 billion increase in the gdp all right so on to governance and anti-corruption the success rates of acquisitions and IPOs is what percent lower on average for companies with investment partners with the same ethnicity? All right, everyone. So, so interestingly enough, the number is actually the 26 to 32 percent. So about one third of you all got that one correctly. Um, according to the Harvard Business Review, the financial performance of companies with homogenous, uh, with homogenous partnerships perform worse than those with more diverse collaborations. And similar statistics were found with companies who share the same school backgrounds as their investors, with that being about 11.5 percent performing worse. And our final question on long-term value creation is uh, the revenue of companies that seek long-term results, cumulative growth, how much percent more on average than the revenue of companies that optimize for short-term results onto you. I think, yes, let me share the results. Uh, yeah, impressively enough, as 36% of you like noticed, uh, the, num the, the percentage is 47. A 2017 McKinsey report, which looked at corporate performance from 2001 to 2014, showed that long-term companies with the highest corporate horizon index scores significantly outperformed companies on the base of revenue their revenue cumulatively grew 47% more on average by 2014 and was less volatile over the same uh, sample period. Awesome, thank you, Natalie and Campbell. Really appreciate that. Let me go over to the next slide. Okay, so we want to just start off by explain, explaining why we are focusing on public purpose and venture capital. The decisions VCs are making do not just impact limited partners, founders, or customers. Instead, the, the decisions to fund and support various types of technology and companies can impact society at large. Venture-backed startups affect not only how we work and how we live and how we move, but also the environment, the economy, democracy, human rights, privacy, and security. The public is experiencing rising economic inequality, increasing climate and public health crises, national security issues, disinformation, hate crimes, a lack of privacy and security of data, mass surveillance, racial injustice, and a lack of diversity and inclusion in STEM, to name just a few issues. Investors have a lot of power and massive responsibility in how our society is shaped and how a lot of those problems can be prevented or at least solved. VCs are rarely held accountable for the negative aspects or harms of their investments. It should not just be up to the founders and the regulators to reduce those harms. So in the defense of VCs, it is really hard to predict negative outcomes and the future. VCs rely on pattern recognition, diligence, scenario building, and other secret sauces to make decisions in the interest of their LPs. We are just hoping they will increasingly do the same for the public. A growing number of VCs have been interested in responsible investing, ESG investing, or impact investing. And climate change and the pandemic have also raised awareness in those areas. As a result of ESG and impact interest, there are hundreds of rating agencies, methodologies, tools, and frameworks to help assess those risks and rewards of the do good, do well investing. We don't want to get caught up in semantics here, which happens often in ESG. But we want to make the distinction between public purpose research and the practices of ESG and impact. So first, 
we have combined existing research across many spaces, the social sciences, economic and political theory, stakeholder capitalism, responsible tech, and also business case studies. We focus the assessments in proactive diligence as opposed to passive measuring and, and reporting just sort of post-investing. And VC and public purpose also puts an emphasis on the investors and the startups working together to examine possible harms. We don't think the startups alone can or should address these areas. We also take into consideration that startups are constantly evolving and often don't have enough established to really properly measure. And most importantly, this cannot be um, over explained, but we want to acknowledge that startups are also really busy. We didn't want to just examine, examine the technology being developed or the companies themselves sort of separately, but instead a combination of the two together. And another area of differentiation, we don't want just impact or ESG investors to think about public purpose. Generalist investors can also assess for public purpose and they should especially as we explore performance indicators throughout our research. We look at growth, profitability, competitive advantage, liquidity, talent, talent turnover, regulation, and public relations. So if used correctly and at the appropriate stage of a company, ESG and impact frameworks can absolutely deliver value in holding companies and their investors accountable. After analyzing over 20 popular agencies and methodologies for their common themes and their pros and cons, many of them fall short for technology first, early stage venture backed startups. Often they fail to capture the negative consequences or risks, focusing a lot on the positives. Some of the common data requested for ESG reporting is not yet available and doesn't always fit in with the new business models and products of early stage startups. So if a startup or investor considers ESG in their process, they're also typically considered um, impact investors to LPs and startups, which can greatly impact their investor relations and their deal flow. ESG and impact reporting can also be a massive, a massive time burden on startups. Financial materiality of impact or ESG is important, but incredibly difficult to assess in the early stages when there is a little less emphasis on revenue and a little bit more emphasis on market size and growth. Startups typically make fast decisions and pivot, as we all know, on operations or business models. So what is measured in one quarter might not make sense in another, making it difficult to measure across time without flexibility. Something that is rarely discussed, but an over-reliance on just numbers and metrics in ESG sort of takes away from the actual stories and the scenarios, hiding some of the most consequential harms behind numbers and reporting. Existing frameworks and methodologies do not always allow for customized risk thresholds either for both the companies and the investors. For instance, a VC or a startup might have more exposure to climate risks, but is well equipped internally to address them. And that might not be reflected in other ESG tools. So over the last six months throughout this fellowship, Natalie Campbell and I have talked to a lot of VCs and a lot of startups to get a better understanding of what their vision of the future is as it relates to venture capital and public purpose. So we wanted to share some of the themes that we heard while talking to both VCs and startups. So on the VC side of things, um, something that we heard a lot, investors with European or public pension LPs have had way more conversations about ESG and impact, even if their fund is not explicitly impact. So let's say it's a generalist fund. So increasingly it shows that LPs really want their money to be used to make positive change. When discussing impact, most efforts around positive are around positive outcomes. So what will this product or service do to sort of help, for example, reduce greenhouse gas emissions or maybe help build low-income housing? But rarely are investors being intentional about what could negatively go wrong or consider unintended or even or unforeseen. Um, let's say like exacerbating inequality or infringing on human rights. Conversations about public purpose or even ESG quickly turn into diversity inclusion discussions. DEI is of course really important, it's important to us, but it should also be part of a larger public purpose effort. You can be thinking about diversity, but you can still be causing harm with products or services. Um, another, another theme that we saw, most VCs who are thinking about negative consequences or ESG have created their own framework or diligence questionnaire as sort of an amalgamation of the tools available today, that customization has been really key to a lot of investors. When talking about long-term value creation and growth, conversations uh, cover policy, government and policy comes up quickly. 
some investors think that government and policy is uh, creating opportunity for startups and investors, while others, particularly those who sort of shy away from highly regulated spaces, were less sure of government or policy as an opportunity. Um, and most want to consider and discuss these things. They want to talk about public purpose. They want to talk about potential negative consequences, but don't necessarily know how. A lot of folks that come from either banking or they come from um, technology don't necessarily have the know-how to really have these conversations about public purpose. Uh, and then also time capacity for both the investors and the startups is a massive constraint. On the startup side, we wanted to figure out how startups' missions aligned with with their investors' vision for the future and how they think about impact and public purpose and long-term value. So in conversations with early stage starter, startups, we realize most want to have conversations with their investors upfront. They want to do it early and they want to get on the same page. They want to talk about what that long-term vision is, as oftentimes that vision is what they use to sort of guide in making decisions. If a VC is going to consider impact, um, or if they're an impact investor, startups want to know what specific data and metrics they should be focusing on upfront again, and to make sure all of the investors are on the same page. Oftentimes, if a startup has multiple investors, they're being asked for different types of data. So sometimes it's not clear or inconsistent, which causes confusion and frustration. Often startups rely on introductions from their investors, and those intros, of course, benefit the company. But often VCs have limited networks. The people they know look like them or have similar lived experiences. So startups would like VCs to grow and diversify their network so those introductions from them continue to be fruitful while using a futures building or harm reduction lens. Another final theme, we have more in our playbook. So if you're interested in these different takeaways, definitely um, send us a note. And we're happy to send over the playbook. But startups need the space and time with their investors to simulate hard decisions that may um, you know, may impact them around the environment, labor, security, and how those decisions really impact their growth or profitability. So some startups seemed a little off guard when we questioned them about preparedness to deal with these extreme areas of public purpose. So investors should really provide startups with the incentives and the resources and the space to consider all of the consequences of their decisions. So we know that there are a lot of options out there to assess impact in ESG but none seem to really fit the public purpose bill perfectly. So we decided to create our own solution, the Venture Capital and Public Purpose Indicator. It's a software tool that we developed to help investors and early stage startups assess their companies and their technology for public purpose, specifically focusing on negative consequences. So VC PPI helps VCs and startups plan ahead for business and public risks related to the environment, labor and inequality, privacy and security, diversity and inclusion, governance and anti-corruption and long-term value creation. The tool looks at decisions that the, that the company has made in the past, how they are currently thinking about decisions in the current and what their plans are for the future, all through a public purpose lens. Here are a few examples on the right side of the screen of things that we may put in our um, inquiries for startups. So for the environment, we want to know how the effects of climate change, so that could be water and food vulnerability, rising temperatures, sea level rise, et cetera, affect the core business model now and in the future. When thinking about labor and inequality, we want VCs and startups to discuss how much a business model relies on low wage or gig labor at any point in the supply chain, or if they plan to, or what percentage of the workers has access to paid time off, healthcare, and other benefits. Another example we ask, does any part of the company's technology observe behaviors from any stakeholder? If yes, does the surveillance limit work autonomy, diminish well-being, or limit workers or the public's privacy? And, and how are those stakeholders being made aware of that observation? Our hope is that with these types of questions, um, both VCs and startups will have structured conversations and nothing will be a surprise. You'll be able to go through a lot of these areas and really have a conversation about how to make those decisions. So right now we'll just show a few features of our tool. Again, if you would like a demo, you can just reach out to us and we're happy to do a full demonstration for anyone who's interested. So one area of our tool is the, the question area. So startups will answer a series of questions related to the various themes of public purpose that we mentioned before. Another area, startups will use our provided framework to evaluate their stakeholders beyond customers and investors 
with a heavy emphasis on the stakeholders' access to both power and resources. And they can also customize who their stakeholders are, and the tool will also guide them on trying to figure out who they are. Startups will also be asked to respond live to scenarios related to public purpose to give an investor a sense of how the startup takes action and makes decisions during those tough situations. And then lastly, the investors are able to analyze the startup's responses to the sections and, and the startup is then provided a score for benchmarking. The VCs and the startups are expected to return to the indicator over time. So this is not something that you should just use once, but you should come back to maybe with a, a business model pivot or through rapid growth, or even when you're thinking about follow on considerations. And that's to really ensure that the progress is continuously made on all of these fronts. Like I said, if anyone is interested in these areas, we're happy to give a full demonstration of the VC PPI tool. It's live right now. In addition to the VC PPI tool, we have also published a playbook to guide VCs and startups that are interested in preventing negative consequences and in laying a public purpose foundation. The playbook uses primary and secondary research, includes business case studies, and provides a ton of extra resources, a lot of reading. So if you don't know about public purpose, you will after reading our playbook. All of the research and the resources used to create the VC PPI can also be found in the playbook. There's the website at the bottom if you're interested in downloading it. For a copy of the playbook or, or a demo, um, follow us. Um, you can send us an email. You can uh, go to our website, shoot us a note. Um, we're happy to do demos. We're happy to send over a copy of the playbook. We're also absolutely open to feedback. So if you're an investor, if you're a startup, if you're someone that's in these spaces, we would love to hear from you and get your thoughts in these spaces. Thank you so much for your interest in our research. We'll now take a couple of questions from the audience. I think we have a couple of questions. Okay. I cannot see the questions. <laughs> I see them coming in, but I'm not able to access them. <laughs> Liz, I can, I, can, I can read out some of the questions. Okay, awesome, awesome. thank you. So the first question that came in was, where did the idea of venture capital plus public purpose, where did that idea come from? Sure, I can take this one. So I worked most of my career in government and policy before joining the team at Urban Us. And so, and that was in 2017. So I often approached investing with sort of a public policy lens. So I thought about stakeholders outside of just the customers and, and the investors. And I, and I often think about like, what are the long-term impacts of these type of investments, right? Like I would ask, like, how does this impact inequality or how does this impact labor, human rights? So that's something that I did often at, at, at Urban Us. And I wanted to figure out a way to sort of scale that type of public purpose and, and scale that type of education to other investors who maybe don't have that same background in policy or government. So this tool in the and the playbook both provide that sort of education and that guidance that maybe other VCs don't have. Great. Uh, another question that came in was, do startups really have the capacity for public purpose? What if they're so early and their business models or products uh, change? I'm happy to take that one if that's all right. Um, the answer is a resounding yes. Startups do have the capacity for public purpose and they should. Um, in a lot of interviews that we conducted with early uh, early stage founders, uh, you know, we saw that um, you know, not only have they had the capacity for it, but they are actively thinking about and looking forward to conversations um, and guidance around public purpose with their investors and with other um, less formal advisors as well. And even if their business models are changing uh, or if their product evolves, that's more than okay. Um, we actually have a great example, uh, having spoken with an early stage founder um, about sort of pivoting their product and gearing more towards a climate related mission in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, for their customers in the hospitality space. And ultimately an angel investor approached them as they made that pivot and recommended that they start considering um, other potential public purpose uh, areas that they could focus in on. And so there that included thinking about other air pollutants that their customers in the hospitality space uh, were emitting and ways that they could reduce that as well. 
So that was kind of a great example, we thought, of uh, sort of the early uh, VC intervention that can kind of help uh, early stage customers uh, refine and explore new market opportunities while still increasing uh, their commitment to public purpose. Mm -hmm. So uh, long story short, anyways, it's more than OK for the company to be um, kind of in an early stage and still developing their business model. Um, but at the same time, public purpose should be at the core of every company and every model. Ultimately, public purpose is tied to a bottom line, so it's beneficial throughout the long term. Um, so that was that was that next question. Uh, another question was by uh, Jennifer, and it's, uh, are there natural startup inflection points where these conversations with VC should be revisited? Uh, I'm happy to. That? Or, or Nat, do you want to take that? Sorry. Please want to take that? Sure, I, I can, can take, take that. that. Um, so, I mean, this tool is definitely something that should be used um, at first in diligence. So, you know, if you've made it through the first couple of conversations, there's a clear fit for the fund, you're interested in making that investment, um, and you start really going into the, the diligence side of things, right? So, you know, this is part of our research. We were asking a lot of VCs, like, what does diligence even look like for you? Um, and a lot of folks were embarrassed to tell us that they were like, we have a lot of questions in a Google Doc, which is awesome. I mean, I think, you know, you use the tools that you have. So we're basically saying that our, our VC PPI sort of can complement those other areas of diligence. So sort of pre-investing. But it's also important to readdress these, these areas on a continuous basis. Obviously, the areas of public purpose are evolving, but also um, so are startups. I, would, I think we've made that point really clear. So it would be helpful, rapid growth, right? Like we know startups have to make a ton of decisions when they grow really fast. Maybe if they get a massive injection of money or if get, they get a lot more customers. Um, if they have to pivot, so let's say their business model or product completely changes, they may want to bring this back up. Um, we've talked to VCs also about how they make follow on considerations um, with pro rata, particularly interested in impact investors. Um, so let's say they made an investment in a company and the company pivots away from that, that initial core impact how they make decisions on if they're going to continue to invest in that company. And it was kind of across the board. Some funds said if it pivoted away from that core impact and let's say it wasn't an impact space anymore, we would no longer invest in them. But um, you know that was just out of their thesis. Some were like, we've already invested in them. We're committed to them. It doesn't necessarily matter if they pivoted. But again, this is something that public purpose and the tool and the playbook that we have is something that should be brought up over time. You should look at it progress over time and not just like throw it on a shelf and forget about it. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that is for investors who take board seats, this is particularly important as they have a lot of power, they have a lot of say, they're more intimately involved in the company. So, you know, oftentimes smaller investors don't have as big of a say um, or don't have, you know, as much of a relationship, let's say, with, with the founders. So for in larger investors, ones that take board seats, this is extremely important um, as they have a lot of say in that. Great. And so there are a few questions um, sort of pertaining to the focus areas. So Liz, maybe this goes to you, sort of which, uh, why did you choose these areas and questions to focus on? How do we know that they're the right ones? And um, Isira sort of followed up with that sort of saying, which area should startups focus on from now on? Yeah. So great questions. Um, a lot of the themes themselves, um, I was sort of sparked and innovated by a lot of the, the TAP, the, the Harvard program that I'm in, a lot of the areas that they were giving us. Um, also, again, my background was more in economics and policy. So there might be an econ lean to some of these questions that we have. But in, in doing our research, I mean, I looked through so much about sort of future of innovation, future of technology, and just sort of tried to take away the themes that I saw. You know, we looked through tons of think tanks um, that cover technology and innovation, future of work, you know, Roosevelt, Brookings, uh, equitable growth. Um, there's a lot of political scientists and economists who have, of course, covered a lot of this work. Uh, we're big fans of Mariana Mazzucato's work. And then uh, Joe Stiglitz, there was other academics from Harvard, like uh, Michael Porter, that have covered a lot of this. Um, we also looked at a lot of the existing ESG and M impact frameworks. They've obviously done a ton of this work. Um, and there are questions that are very similar in ours that are in ESG and impact. 
a lot of times we'll frame them a little different. So they're obviously more startup friendly and sort of more open to the changes of a startup. Um, and so, but I will say that there, these themes, these questions can all be customized as well. So right now we have a lot of questions, a lot of blanket statements, you know, the themes are, are just there for anyone to sort of assess. In our playbook, we provide additional questions that are not in the tool. And we also talk about how the themes can be expanded, right? So um, we can talk about mental health as an area that probably can be dedicated, have its own area. Uh, Human-centered design is an area. Talking about democracy and thinking of, like deeply about democracy and technology. So there's definitely more beyond this, but um, the, the books that we were reading, The Economist, the, the think tanks that we were following, these are the major themes that popped up. And as for where startups should really focus, that requires a lot of uh, customization as to what the type of technology and the type of company that they are. Um, and that's the hope is to have the startups and the VCs to really talk about all these areas. There's not one that's more important than the other. All of these things should be created equal, I think. But of course, you know, if you're a surveillance company, then you have one area that's really important to address more so than others. So we put it all out there in an ideal world as we were to get sort of more data and more insight on different startups and more VCs, we would be able to customize the question based off of the type of technology, the type of company, and also the stage of the company, because the questions sort of change depending on how far along they are. So hopefully that answered that question. Great. And just to kind of piggyback off of that, Claire, Claire asked sort of, can startups focus on one of these areas over another? Um, you know, the, the answer is yes, right? Sort of as Liz was mentioning, uh, you can prioritize depending on sort of which area, you're, you're, which market you're in and what, what is your target, uh, target customer, et cetera. Um, that said, you know, all six of the areas that we focused in on, uh, they do interplay with each other very much so. And it's important to take a look at and consider all of those key areas. Just because you're a startup that's focused on climate and the environment doesn't mean you could ignore questions around good governance and anti-corruption. So all of these will kind of help feed into one another, some more so than others. And I think it's important to, we think it's important to um, take a look at all of them, but recognize that there might be some, some areas of prioritization over others. Um, great. So that kind of answers a little bit about sort of the key themes. I guess another great question was from Melissa here, and it says, does the tool allow for goal setting based on the initial outcome? For example, does the tool provide guidance for metrics to hit? Liz, do you want to take that one? Sure. So this is, I think that question is fantastic. I think, how do you actually take all this insight and put it into action, right? Like how you actually make decisions. It's something we've thought about a lot. Like, what is this, what does this actually look like? What does this behavior look like? And so, you know, a lot of the startups that we work with at Urban Us use a lot of OKRs. And so, you know, when, when you've gone through, let's say the assessment and you get like a really poor score in an area, um, that might be an area that you want to focus on over the next quarter, let's say. But again, it depends on, you know, what is your exposure to that area right now um, and how, how confident are you in that area? So we try to look at both of those areas. But again, how can you bring it back into your OKRs? How can you bring it back into your goals? Um, again, I think this is also really important for investors. And I try to emphasize that a lot, that this should not just be for the startups, but like, again, investors could bring these things up, right? Or ask them these questions. Or when you're doing a check-in with uh, a startup as an investor, like, how do you bring up these questions and like, ask them, like, how does this affect the decisions that you're making on a day-to-day -day basis for company building or product? So it definitely, the hope is after you get the score and you get the sort of analysis at the end of the tool, you're able to take away that insight and incorporate it into either quarterly goal setting uh, annual goal setting, or again, let's say board meetings. That's also another area where you can bring it in. Just to complement that um, and to emphasize the point that Liz made, uh, the idea is that the VCs, they have the flexibility to grade the answers that they receive and to make that as a basis for continuous conversation over progress and the metrics uh, they define like to be hit over time so that like purpose like evolve as the business models, as the products of the Easter tops also do. I also like to see two other questions related to the tool, uh, which I think we might like want to respond now, which is, uh, is like how long it would take a startup to complete the, VC, the, the VCPPI 
And uh, the other one also around it too is can a fund white label our VCPPI tool and can it be used for other areas of diligence? Um, for the final question, the, the answer are like two very confident yes, yes. Um, funds can white label the tool uh, and that's pr pretty much like the goal here uh, and that can definitely be used for other areas of diligence. Liz, you wanna uh, deep dive a little bit on, on the time it takes? Sure, and I'll expand off of the white labeling thing because we've actually gotten this question a lot from VCs who are interested in using this tool for all their areas of uh, diligence if they're impact or not. And basically saying, I wanna get off Google Docs. Can your tool help me in all of these other areas? Something we're absolutely open to. Um, there's a lot of other startups that are doing similar things and always happy to make those introductions as well. Um, startups that are helping VCs help other startups, which is fun. Um, so absolutely open to white labeling. If, if um, VCs want to customize the questions, we're absolutely open to those conversations. How long it takes? Again, the, the questions right now, there's a lot of questions on there across all six themes. And in an ideal world, we would customize those questions based off of the needs of the, the VC and the startup. As of right now, it takes about an hour to get through the three different sections, um, which is a lot of time, but uh, an hour is worth it. Um, and then on the other side, for the VC to sort of evaluate the questions after they've submitted, it would take a little under an hour, I would say. So we timed it internally how long it took us. So it was about an hour for each person, so. Great, um, another great question in here is, does the public purpose indicator tool, um, is it supposed to replace other frameworks or methodologies? Natalie, do you wanna take that? Sure, I'm happy to take this one. We see these, um, we see the VC, PPI tool more as a complement than a substitute for these established frameworks. So for instance, um, the ESG and the impact frameworks, they're really helpful in helping investors capture and, and measure um, um, on a series of indicators that are like broadly known into the community. Uh, but as Liz was saying during the presentation, they fall short into like important aspects for capturing shared value in the specific environment of technology startups. So for instance, they don't offer our, a very comprehensive model to predict and solve for the negative consequence of technology, for the unintended consequence, consequence of technology. So just by way of, of example, like based on our like several like conversations, uh, we see that uh, ESG environmentally focused frameworks, they highlight the benefits uh, of companies that let's say switch the suppliers to make sure that these suppliers use uh, their materials, they source them sustainably. Uh, but at the same time, they lack a more expensive view on, on less maybe obvious societal aspects, like for instance, how these new climate tech companies affect job creation and cause job displacement or create new jobs or markets. So this is this is basically where our our VC PPI tool comes into play to complementing the existing ESG and impact frameworks. I see a couple of questions in the chat that maybe I'll throw out there because I think a couple of them are great. Um, Paula asked, VCs say that startups working with the government and um, public purpose cannot scale and provide stellar returns. Any idea on how to break this loop? Either of you want to take a, take a try at it and I'll add on to it. All right, I'll start. <laughs> Um, I think this is a, a topic that has come up a lot. And I think, again, Mariana Mazzucato um, has talked a lot about how important government has been with innovation. And a lot of the technology that we have today from the internet, cell phones, um, vaccinations, you know, a lot of it has been government supported, government funded. And so to say government is not at all important. Um, on the other side of that, also, when we talk about climate tech, climate tech is massive right now. You know, a lot of VCs are pivoting into that space. We're able to have those conversations because there is a policy conversation as well, right? And so it's, it's hard to sort of divorce the two. Um, so if a VC is, is saying that government has nothing to do with innovation, I think it's a lack of understanding in, hist in really history on how that goes. Um, and so in the, the side of it saying that, like, if you think about impact or if you think about public purpose, that those things cannot scale, there is some truth that there are some things that are not venture scalable, um, which is a broader conversation about how we fund innovation as a whole. Like, does 
VC have to be the only area that's really funding this type of innovation in the private sector. Um, you know, and there are a lot of solutions in the government on a federal level, state and, and local level as to how to fund um, more localized, not necessarily venture scalable innovation. So, um, but of course, there are a ton of public purpose and impact companies that are venture scalable and that have seen massive returns. Um, Urban Us, our portfolio to plug it. Um, we have a ton of um, awesome startups in our portfolio that have seen unicorns, unicorn size um, scale and they're mostly all impact. They have some sort of positive impact on society. So, um, and again, there are some that are impactful and full of public purpose, but when you kind of lift up the hood and you start thinking about like, should this be something that a startup should be doing or is this something maybe the public sector should be doing? It's another conversation, but also just one worth having. It's like, who should really be owning this? Should we be privatizing that? Definitely another conversation, but still interesting nonetheless. Natalie or Campbell, anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, I would just add to that because it, I think Liz, you covered a lot of the of the role of government on like uh, earth shotting to results. Um, and there is another thing that I mean became like clear for us as as we were doing research and also like talking um, to both investors and startups, which is this idea that. It, there is um, there is like this perception that there is less of attention and more of a convergence around um, financial results and public purpose results. So just to mention a very like recent um, you know piece of information that uh, that uh, we read and analyzed is this uh, research disease study uh, coordinated by the Oxford uh, Business School showing that the companies with the stronger public purpose indications, specifically environmental, social, and governance indicators, uh, they, they record like financially, they, they perform it way better than the peers in the, in the early months of the COVID crisis. So this is one example showing like how even like general companies, um, even startups and investors who are not necessarily focused on the, in the impact world, they can actually uh, converge these interests and they, and they are actually converging uh, when, they, when they think about purpose like more intentionally over the, over the long run and, and uh, in a you know, crisis situation, uh, including. Yeah, I think just kind of echoing, echoing what has already been said, but I do think there has been a stigma that, you know, if you are focused on public good, on public purpose, uh, you will not have the same returns. And to Liz's point, I think increasingly you're seeing that that's not the case. Uh, I think that there is a real um, advantage to taking a look at all of your different stakeholders and the impact that you're having as a startup um, on them. That provides much more durability um, in terms of your model. It can sustain shocks as Natalie was just mentioning around a COVID pandemic, um, but also just you're, you're setting yourself up for success across the long term. Um, so I think the the idea of, you know, growing fast and breaking things is no longer sort of the norm. I think that's pretty passe at this point. And so I think really, um, you know, sort of growing conscientiously and making sure that you are taking a look at not just your customers, but the broader broader society is, is critically important. I have one more question in chat that I can just put out there and maybe the three of us can discuss. Um, why are you focused on VC where ownership tends to be the smallest and less so on growth or PE investment? I'm gonna take a stab at this. I thought a lot about in the beginning, like what the theory of change, who the sort of like um, people we should focus on are. I, I have only invested in the early stage or been in a fund that invests in the early stage. So I don't have PE experience. So I, I, I couldn't really get into that, to be honest. But I also felt like where the gaps were in these analysis was more in the early stage. So there's been an increasing amount of people that want to make ESG work in the early stages. And I think in our conversations and our research, we've been realizing that people are running into a lot of issues with trying to make ESG, which was built for corporates, larger companies, later stage, and trying to make that happen for startups. And so that was really the main issue for um, larger companies that have been acquired. Um, you know, there's an exit, they're massive, they become this great corporation. ESG is great. Like there are a lot of ESG options out there. So um, despite the sort of like small ownership that VCs can have, they still have a ton of influence, particularly if they have board seats or if they're major investors. So um, even though they're earlier stage, uh, I wouldn't sell short the importance of the VCs. And, you know, that's why there's so much risk in the early stage of VC, but there is also a ton of reward. So 
that that's where we sort of wanted to focus on just for that exact reason is sort of the laying the foundation, if you will. And I'll just echo having having worked in growth equity. Uh, I do think that at that at that sort of stage and, and later, of course, right, the business model has been proven out. Um, and so there is less opportunity for input into thinking about how to incorporate public purpose into the mission. Uh, of course, there's always other sort of initiatives, but it may not necessarily be core to their business at that point. So I do think that the, the earlier stage is really that critical moment to begin to ask these questions and have these really targeted conversations. I'll just add with two, like maybe minor points, but uh, there is like this imagery that when you have like a ship uh, on the ocean, like, and you can uh, change its course, even if a little bit in the beginning, that has a huge, uh, that makes a huge difference in the final direction. So I think the idea here is here, like working with VCs and startups is to, you know, calibrate and moving to like public purpose very early on uh, can have like a huge like long-term impact for them and for the new markets uh, that these startups like create um, and come to innovate on. And I, maybe like another reason uh, in addition to what like Liz and Cam uh, already flashed out is that like we, we truly felt a demand with the startups that we talked to like for, for the research really felt a demand, a willingness to uh, incentives coming from their VCs around public purpose. They felt like interested, they felt they, they could do more, but they had huge questions around which metrics they should use and why this is not coming from my VC and how, how helpful it would be if it was coming. Or for instance, in another area where we saw a lot of like defense from startups, but at the same time, willingness to get better is around conducting scenario planning exercise for unintended consequences that were relevant for, for, for their business models or, or for the new technology they were developing. So we really felt this demand for a direction coming from their VCs. David asks an interesting question uh, here in the Q&A, which is, what did this work tell you all about the public purpose of venture capital itself as a tool? It's relative utility for creating new things versus public funding, uh, concerns around the concentration of wealth upwards and so on. Um, I have so many thoughts on that. Um, I can go first. Um, as someone who comes from more of the government policy space, um, working in VC and working with startups was always sort of testing a theory of change. Like, can you use private capital to make a difference in this world, right? where people say government moves slow and policy is difficult and politics are annoying. Like, can we just sort of cut through the noise and use technology innovation and startups to sort of make that change? And I always felt like, in the, it, I always had this feeling that no, you always will need government and policy um, to make that change. And that's how I still feel today. I think some startups um, have created awesome innovation and there's been fantastic technology, but I don't think that it, I think Silicon Valley takes a lot of credit for that where they don't necessarily, where they should. And I think that again, that they don't take a lot of the, the flaws or the negative side of that. They sort of just walk away with their money and, and their, um, I guess, gold stars, if you will. So I, um, I think that um, startups and VC have exacerbated inequality. Um, I think that there's a lot of harmful tech out there that doesn't need to exist. Um, I think VCs are tend to be a lot of times um, white men with a lot of money that are dictating how our lives are, right? Like how we work, how we live, how we move, um, which is a problem. And so um, I'm definitely a fan of the idea of government, again, being um, not forgotten as, this, as a place where innovation happens um, and can be more thoughtful and center public purpose. And so... Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I think it would be another event to really get into that, but um, it does make you question um, a lot of aspects of capitalism, where is that, that sort of build and break in that idea and sort of rethinking what that actually should look like in the future. Yeah, and just, just to add on though, I will say that the research all in all, at least for me personally, has made me feel much more encouraged uh, in terms of uh, the role of venture capital. I, I, don't, I don't disagree at all with Liz's points. I think there is a lot to be problematic uh, within VC sort of as a whole entity, but um, you know, given sort of the large amount of dollars that are there, it's continuing to grow. Companies are staying private for longer, um, but to see all in all so many VCs, whether they're at the earlier stage or even all the way through uh, to you know, more mature PE firms, they're all beginning to take this turn and begin to have these conversations with companies in their portfolio. So I do think there are some encouraging tailwinds. And so we're hoping that conversations like these help 
help move it, help move the, the industry forward a bit. Uh, I see two more questions here in the Q&A. So uh, one is from Muneeb, which is, um, is active involvement in public purpose conducive to startups profitability and long-term growth? What incentives ought there be for startups to put public purpose at their core? Liz, you wanna start with that one? Sure. Um, so I mentioned in our presentation that there are sort of uh, performance indicators that are important to think about with these things. Um, you know, that's been a, a big criticism of ESG as it stands is there isn't always the direct combination of sort of like what the ESG is and sort of what is the value it's creating. Um, it is really hard to like make that direct connection, but there's sort of indirect connections, right? And so like one area is talent. Um, increasingly younger people are interested in working in more mission-driven companies and like ones that have like a heart and a soul and that aren't creating harm. So that that's one. And also on the other side of that is turnover as well. Like people are more likely to stay at a place if they align with them from a mission. Um, I also think like uh, there's the sort of legal expenses. Um, we or even the regulatory things and so you know a lot of our public purpose questions a lot of the areas will actually help a startup navigate potential areas of, of regulation as well um and there's a lot of startups that you know maybe get a massive injection from a silicon valley uh vc that helps them navigate regulatory spaces by hiring expensive lawyers but there's a lot of early stage startups that can't handle that level of scrutiny from a regulator so um you know, a lot of times we'll ask at Urbanus, like, what is your experience? Do you have any policy experience if it's in a highly regulated space? Or, you know, are you, are, do you deeply understand the space that you're going into from a risk level on a policy level? Um, there's a lot of startups that like see a problem, create a solution, but they don't necessarily have deep expertise and therefore maybe don't foresee those regulatory issues. Um, so that's, you know, those are other ways that like you can sort of help navigate um, the early stage issues so those are just two examples, but I don't know, Nat or Campbell, if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, maybe like on another aspect of that, like some of the most interesting startups we've talked to uh, actually had the increase in their public purpose impact match with the long-term profitability. So I think Cam like mentioned one of those examples of a startup whose like solution, whose technology helped uh, reduce um, GAG emissions and in a conversation with uh, investors early, very early on, uh, upon the suggestion of improving that to also prevent the, the, the release of other kinds of pollutants, uh, developed a new solution that in the long run prove very profitable. Like we often like heard these conversations, especially with the startups that were like more mature on the conversations around public purpose. Uh, about the trade-offs they had to do um, in the very like even earlier stages around short-term profitability and long-term. Um, I can go like into the details of all of them because the, the interviews are anonymized, but we, we had like very clear examples of suggestions on the other way around, like different from this example I gave on GHG of like changes in technology that would like maybe spike like short-term returns and they, they refused to do that out of their like purpose mission. Uh, and they had actually like a great outcome in the long run because of their, you know, consistent with the mission and with the purpose um, in the long run again. So we saw, we, we really saw like profitability over their long run and purpose, like coming hand in hand, at least with, in the conversations we had. Great. Uh, so last question that I see anyways in the Q&A comes from Jennifer, which is, it's a very interesting question. What are your thoughts on startups developing dual use technologies? It's a great question. That is a great question. Um, I think it really depends on the stage of the company. I think capacity, like from a strictly like investor perspective, I think it depends on, you know, what is their actual capacity? Can you be thoughtful if you have two different use cases, uh, which is I think really difficult to do in the, the really early stages. But, um, you know, they, let's say you have a little bit more capacity and you're um, doing two different things with two different products or one product with two different um, use cases. I think, it's, I think it's really tricky. And I think it's sort of like um, uh, the same way that like companies that are selling to the government sometimes will sell to business in parallel as a, like a sneaky way to, to sort of 
um, you know, show growth. Um, I think, it, again, I think it really would depend. I would have to like look into it. Um, I think it's a little um, maybe dishonest, I think from like a branding perspective as well. Like I think a lot of times or like, I would also want to figure out like what they're doing with all that data, if they're collecting data, like, or, you know, there's just a lot internally that I think would have to be evaluated. But um, my gut is to say it's sometimes sneaky and sometimes smart. So um, I think it depends. <laughs> I very much agree on that. I would, I would just sort of, I would just chime in as well by saying that, um, you, you, you know, so long as they're asking a lot of the questions that we've even posed, this is another plug perhaps for our tool or for our playbook, you know, if they're asking these questions honestly of themselves and, um, you, you know, able to forthrightly kind of take into consideration all potential stakeholders, then, um, you know, then obviously it's probably in a better position than, than those that are not. So to that, to that point, I'm being sneaky, you know, questions around public purpose will, you know, regardless kind of help, um, you know, put, put it, put them, put them into the best possession, um, you know, for the future. So that was the, uh, the last question. So uh, with that, I'll leave it to Liz to maybe wrap up. Thank you. Thank you all for participating and for your interest in our research. This has been definitely a labor of love and we want to continue this even after my fellowship ends and um, after Campbell um, and Natalie leave Harvard. So definitely keep in touch with us. Our emails are on here. Our website is on there. Happy to pick up the conversation. If you have feedback or thoughts, um, definitely reach out to us. We're, we're definitely eager to talk to folks about our research and our tool and our playbook. So thank you all so much for participating. Take care.